Welcome, everybody. Welcome to this session on depicting evil, uh, a challenge for novelists and painters and filmmakers how to portray evil in debt, in word or image. If you're looking for good, there's probably another session in some other room, but this one is about evil. And to have us reflect about the depiction of evil, we have a novelist and a theologian and an art historian. And uh, our first speaker will be the novelist, actually he's a novelist and a public intellectual, Randy Boyagoda is the principal and uh, he's the vice president of St. Michael's College in Toronto, but unlike most university administrators, he also actually teaches in a classroom, and he teaches English, so he is well situated to speak on this topic. He has two novels published and one in the making, and his writing has been compared to, get this, the great Catholic novelist Evelyn Waugh. So, Randy is well situated to speak on his topic, which is, what is evil? It is, a, is it a clown? And for those of you who don't read Stephen King, it is, among other things, a reflection on that very scary novel, It, by Stephen King. Randy. Thank you very much, Marianne, for that, that very warm introduction. Um, the far more economic introduction happened, though, a few minutes ago uh, when I ran into someone at the back of this hall and I started explaining my talk and uh, the woman coming out said, wait, wait, so you're the clown. And, and then there was a pause and she went, you mean you're talking about the clown and that's, and that's, uh, that's right. So my topic is, what is evil? Is it really a clown? Uh, before I begin, I, I do want to say first how grateful I am to be here uh, back at Notre Dame for this, uh, for this fantastic conference, not least because of just how, how engaged and engaging the material is, but also because it means that I am currently not driving four little girls to 17 different ballet lessons, which is what my Saturday in Toronto is usually spent doing. <laughs> A little bit of Catholic guilt because my wife's doing all of it in the meantime, but we'll get over that. Okay, so, what is evil? Is it really a clown? In my remarks this afternoon, I will be bringing together a series. I will be breaking the microphone. There we go. One sec, there we go. In my remarks this afternoon, I will be bringing together a series of classic and abiding sources for thinking about the nature of evil and how it's represented in literature and the arts, including Augustine, Aquinas, and Dante. That said, I would like to begin by drawing on two classic sources and bringing them together like so many have done before, and that's Joseph Ratzinger and Stephen King. <laughs> Let me start by reading a selection from the opening to Ratzinger's introduction to Christianity in 1968. And for reasons that should be clear enough, as my remarks develop, I encourage you to pay a special mind to the figure of the clown in Ratzinger's opening articulation of the problem of religious belief, specifically belief in the propositions of Christianity in the modern age. Anyone who tries today to talk about the question of Christian faith in the presence of people who are not thoroughly at home with ecclesiastical language and thought soon comes to sense the alien and alienating nature of such an enterprise he will probably soon have the feeling that his position is only too well summed up in Kierkegaard's famous story of the clown and the burning village. According to this story, a traveling circus in Denmark caught fire. The manager thereupon sent the clown, who was already dressed and made up for the performance, into the neighboring village to fetch help, especially as there, were there was danger that the fire would spread across the fields of dry stubble and engulf the village itself. The clown hurried into the village and requested the inhabitants to come as quickly as possible to the blazing circus and help to put the fire out. But the villagers took the clown's shouts simply for an excellent piece of advertising meant to attract as many people as possible to the performance. They applauded the clown and laughed till they cried. The clown felt more like weeping than laughing. 
He tried in vain to get the people to be serious, to make it clear to them that this was no stunt, that he was not pretending but was in bitter earnest, that there really was a fire. His supplications only increased the laughter. People thought he was playing his part splendidly until finally the fire did engulf the village. It was too late for help, and both circus and village were burned to the ground. Now here Ratzinger cites Harvey Cox as citing this very story to continue with Ratzinger as an analogy of the theologian's position today. The theologian as the clown who cannot make people really listen to his message. In his medieval or at any rate old-fashioned clown's costume, he is simply not taken seriously. Whatever he says, he is ticketed and classified, so to speak, by his role. Whatever he does in his attempts to demonstrate the seriousness of the position, people always know in advance that he is just, in fact, a clown. Now, as we would expect, having offered this analogy, Ratzinger proceeds to develop it in ways that make the dilemma of modern belief more complex and personally implicating than merely lamenting that theologians come across as clowns not to be taken seriously. For my own purposes this afternoon, the figure of a clown as someone not to be taken seriously, when it comes to higher order questions of human life and value, has much to do with the most prominent clown to figure in American popular culture in recent months. That's Pennywise, the malevolent antagonist of Stephen King's 1986 novel, It, which has been turned into a new cinematic adaptation by director Andy Muschietti that was released in early September. The story goes something like this. Set in the small town of Derry, Maine in the 1980s, a group of teenage misfits tries to make sense of why people, and children in particular, go missing at a rate that's much higher in their town than anywhere else in America. These disappearances have a particular significance for one character, Bill, whose little brother Georgie is one of the latest to go missing. As the story develops, the characters have terrifying encounters, individually and collectively, with a malevolent clown, Pennywise, who, we learn, emerges from a netherworld every 27 years to feed on the children of Derry. With adults either not taking note or purposefully ignoring the situation, the kids themselves decide to fight the clown and attempt to banish it from their town and their lives for good. Now, as I'm sure many of you know, King's novel is a thousand pages long. The movie is two hours. I have about 18 minutes. So it strikes me as efficient to show you the trailer now and to proceed from there into a discussion of what it means for our culture to regard evil as a clown. So now we're going to pause. Anyone with small children, now's a good time to go for a walk. Yes, we're all good? We're all good? Yes, thank you very much, sir. OK, no other kids. Really, I really do mean that. It's a, it's a, I wouldn't show my kids this. I would rather drive them to ballet many times in a row than have them see this. So that said. And do we want the lights on or off? Aww. Off, OK. <laughs> off we go. Yes. 
Now you were all laughing at the beginning and it got more and more quiet as that trailer developed, didn't it? When it was first released earlier this year, that trailer generated 197 million views in 24 hours. The movie itself, which broke a record, never before have that many people seen uh, a trailer in that shortest uh, time. The movie itself had a budget of $35 million, and it has grossed worldwide to date $600 million and broken various box office records. Reviews have been generally positive, but no one is pointing to this movie as some kind of signal masterpiece of American cinema. Why, then, has it proven so popular and why does this popularity matter to us and to the concerns and themes of this conference? For two reasons. First, to cite a representative assessment of the film, New York Times film critic A.O. Scott observed that the clown in the movie is, quote, the literal lethal manifestation of evil in this world, and that its success in pursuing its purposes, quote, is abetted and to some extent camouflaged by the ordinary human awfulness that also afflicts the town of Derry. Namely, an ugly assortment of bullies, gossips, and abusive parents. Unintentionally, I presume, Scott here invokes two traditional and intersecting conceptions of evil. Evil as a phenomenon, and evil as the outcome of free will gone wrong. I will say more on these points in a moment, but for now, by way of the commentary I cited earlier from Ratzinger, the movie immediately suggests to us we needn't take the phenomenon of evil seriously because it comes in the form of a clown. Indeed, we can be entertained by it. And we have been, as the box office receipts suggest, and with one particular de demographic in mind, which brings me to the second reason why I think this movie merits some attention. Almost 50% of the people attending it, according to film industry demographic analysis, are in their late teens and early 20s. Now, by way of transition, let's shift from Ratzinger's introduction of Christianity to Christian Smith's cogent and now damn near canonical account of millennial religious belief, what he terms moralistic therapeutic deism. I am going to argue, as this talk develops, that the very same sensibility that's captured in and as moralistic therapeutic deism finds an appealing and effective corollary in evil as it's represented in this movie and in how we are called to respond to its presence in our lives. Evil itself, in the Catholic intellectual tradition, has two major and long since synthesized source definitions that I think are especially germane to a discussion of the representation of evil in narrative arts like literature and film. The first account from St. Augustine in his writings on Genesis and the Fall and in response to challenges from the Manichees concerns the existence of evil as a lesser result of the greater good of God's creating man with a free will. <coughs> This is, in fact, the very line that runs and cuts through every human heart. The second main account of evil comes to us from Aquinas, who, in consonance with and extending out of Augustine, proposes in the Summa, quote, what evil is must be known from the nature of the good, 
which eventually leads to an understanding of evil as deprivation, as the absence of the good. That this absence is something made possible and enacted by our combined status as fallen individuals endowed with free wills has long been written about by theologians and others. And likewise, the question of how should we understand the existence of evil beyond our individuated susceptibility to it. This latter matter interests me especially in the context of this paper. How should we understand evil in and as an external phenomena, even presence, especially if, by way of Aquinas, it is a deprivation, an absence? The great majority of us, I think, have long naturally turned to two sources in our attempts to make sense of evil as an external phenomenon, the visual arts and stories. My fellow panelists this afternoon will speak thoughtfully on the question of the visual arts, while from my vantage, as a novelist and a professor of English, it's to narratives that we turn for understanding so much about human experience, including the problem of evil. Indeed, as the French philosopher Paul Ricoeur argued in his magisterial three-volume study, Time and Narrative, human beings are, by nature, storytelling creatures. We understand ourselves and our lives in narrative terms, and we seek the same understanding in engaging people and phenomena around us. Think about it for a moment. If someone asks you how you spent your day, what do you naturally do? You tell a story. And that's why it is so profoundly awkward and unsatisfying when you ask someone how they spent their day, and the answer is, I took 783 steps. <laughs> it's, it's a little embarrassing for everyone when that happens, but it's also <laughs> deeply unsatisfying because it's a data ex output. It's not a narrative. We rely on narrative. Now, this is all straightforward enough when it comes to much of human experience, including, I add, evidence of evil that results from the disordered exercise of our will. But if we accept Aquinas' definition of evil as privation, as absence of the good, this poses a natural paradox for any artist. How do you create something, a presence, to represent an absence? Before returning to the representation of evil in the movie It, I think the best way to make sense of this is for all of us to go to hell. In the 34th canto of Dante's Inferno, Dante and Virgil reach the icy depths of hell, the fourth ring of the ninth circle, where they encounter Lucifer, the massive emperor of this inverted kingdom, who we are reminded, quote, was once, as handsome, was once a handsome presence. No longer, obviously, but in Dante's rendering, his present hideousness is a privation pointing to a presence. And for us, this is a, I think, preeminent demonstration of how a literary artist gives shape and logic to the representation of evil. Dante observes of Lucifer that, quote, if he was once as handsome as he now is ugly, and despite that, raised his brows against his maker, one can understand how every sorrow has its source in him. Thereafter, Dante offers us a striking view of this ugliness. He has three faces, one in front blood red, and then another two that just above the midpoint of each shoulder joined the first. Each of Satan's faces is winged. His six eyes weep tears and blood, and he is encased in ice and eternally eating and flaying and crushing three traitors, Judas, Brutus, and Cassius. Virgil informs Dante that as their last hike through hell, they must climb Satan's icy, shaggy flanks because, quote, it is by such stairs that we must take our leave of so much evil. Eventually, the poet and his guide emerge, quote, to see once more the stars, and from there make their way to purgatory and eventually to paradise. I think we'd be hard pressed to find a literary representation better than Dante of evil as both acts of disordered will, resulting in damnation, and as an exterior phenomenon whose depravity affirms supreme goodness and presence, not least because this representation corresponds so fully to clarity, proportion, and integrity, the three defining features of a work of art that H.N. Gilson, Umberto Eco, and other modern scholars and thinkers have written about, have been also taken this from Aquinas. When it comes to Inferno, the poem's clarity is evident in how it unfolds a story that radiates an intelligibility about the consequences of leading a life governed by a disordered free will. The poem's proportion is evident in its integration of metaphysical and physical logics, particularly with respect to the kinds of physical punishments sinners endure in proportion to and in reflection of their offenses against the will of God. Finally, the poem's integrity is evident in its wholeness of imagined world, inferno, purgatory, paradise, and the many syntheses and integrations and harmonies that endow the poem with such force and meaning. 
as, with its rendering and revelation of, quote, so much evil, as Virgil puts it, we move through the nine circles of hell, culminating in Dante and Virgil's encounter with Lucifer. So now, from Augustine, Aquinas, and Dante, are we really going to move to Stephen King in the movies? Yes, and here's why. Especially when it comes to the relationship between faith and art, whether seeking depictions and evocations of the good, true, and beautiful, or of evil, religiously serious people today tend to only look in one direction, the past. Now, I do not say that only out of autobiographical frustration. As a working Catholic novelist, I have in other format, forums, forums referred to what I've called my Flannery O'Connor problem and yours. It's the great challenge when you're a Catholic writer. You're at a dinner party, you're at a conference, you're anywhere with anyone else, and right when they hear that you're Catholic and you're a novelist, in my head I go, three, two, one. Do you like Flannery O'Connor? <laughs> I plead the fifth. Okay. The, uh, and then, I should, I should point out, for balance, I had the same problem whenever I'm at any kind of um, Christian Protestant gathering, and it's Marilyn Robinson in that case. Inevitably, Marilyn Robinson comes up. So those are, that's the Cillian Charybdis of a working Christian writer today, <laughs> O'Connor and Robinson. But look, really, beyond my own autobiographical frustration with that, if we are called to read the signs of the times and engage the culture, that means more than merely lamenting that people don't read enough C.S. Lewis and G.K. Chesterton. In the present example, this means making sense of why a pretty good movie featuring an evil clown has enjoyed so much commercial success. It doesn't hold up very well against Aquinas. Against clarity, proportion, and integrity, as we shall see, precisely because it's finally governed by an understanding of evil itself and of our response to it that amounts to moral therapeutic deism's evil twin. Pennywise preys on children by identifying and then exploiting their fears. As such, each of the main characters in the story at multiple points is terrified by the clown's workings, in most every case by something ghoulish or strange and threatening that has its source in unresolved childhood trauma, in personal struggle, or in a family issue. These encounters often happen in the middle of grown-ups who never notice anything. Bill struggles with his little brother Georgie's death and is unintentionally playing a part in it by, as per the trailer, building him a paper boat that falls into a gutter where Pennywise appears and kills him. Mike struggles with memories of a house fire that killed his parents and others while sparing him. Beverly is going through puberty. Stanley, the son of a rabbi, um, basically at Stanley, the son of a rabbi, a fact that has no religious meaning whatsoever in a movie about evil, I add, has to fetch things by himself from his father's forbidding office. Eddie is a hypochondriac, and Richie, well, Richie doesn't like clowns. Pennywise manifests himself to each child in ways that capitalize on these fears, and the power of his evil resides in his ability to scare them into submission, captivity, and death. But none of these fears have anything to do with evil produced by either disordered acts of free will or deprivations of the good. To be sure, the movie more broadly provides us evidence of both, especially when it comes to representations of free will enacted in fallen ways. The townspeople have a tacit collective capacity to choose to ignore the awfulness around them. Nowhere more starkly than when an old lady watches from her front window while little Georgie struggles in front of a gutter and then a moment later disappears into it. She does nothing about this. More immediately in relation to the main characters of the story, Beverly's father abuses her while all of the kids are subjected to taunts, bullying, and brutal attacks by a vicious band of older teenagers led by a kid named Patrick whose rage and violence make him susceptible to Pennywise, who chooses not to prey on Patrick's fears, but instead to tempt him to ever worse acts of violence against both the main characters and even members of his own family. In these secondary ways, the movie demonstrates clear and engaging components of clarity, proportion, and integrity, and in that sense, succeeds as much as a commercial film in 2017 can as an aesthetic representation of evil. But the film's overall ambition is greater than that and too captive, alas, to the weak religious spirit of the age. 
in the movie's climactic sequence, Pennywise captures Bev and spirits her away to his sewer system dungeon, where he does not kill her, but instead places her in a kind of levitating trance. Her friends decide they must rescue her and also put an end to this evil clown before he takes any more children from town. They enter his lair and endure an escalating set of terrors, both collectively and tailored to each of them, culminating in Bill's meeting what appears to be his murdered little brother, who pleads with Bill to bring him home. Through much suffering, Bill recognizes that this isn't his little brother, but instead a manifestation of Pennywise, which leads eventually to a kind of extended action movie style battle that results in a stalemate between the kids and the clown. It's now that Bill and the other characters discover why the clown hasn't killed them, or more accurately, why he can't kill them. There are three reasons, only one of which I think is reasonable and, and meaningful. It's the first. Their friendship with each other provides solidarity and a call to courage and sacrifice that defeats the isolating fears and self-interest that the clown depends upon. Beyond that, though, each character realizes that the terrors confronting them are another, nothing other than externalized psychological issues and not real. Third, Bill realizes that the reason Bev isn't dead yet, well before her friends joined her or she discovered these psychological sources of Pennywise's power, or before her trance is broken by a courageous kiss from a friend with a secret crush, before all of that, she decides she's not scared of Pennywise. He can't kill what's not scared of him. But, and this is important, the movie is entirely silent about why she's not scared of him. It offers no substantial evidence for this, but just presumes as much, and then quickly moves into the next sequence in which Bill and his friends turn the tables on Pennywise, knowing that now he's the one who's scared, and indeed he escapes away into a deep well where he will wait until the movie's sequel comes out in a couple of years. <laughs> With the clown gone, the kids rally around each other, and the movie ends in a gauzy, feel-good way. The music and imagery affirm that because they believed in each other and believed in themselves, they have defeated evil. <laughs> Moral therapeutic deism, as Christian Smith and his colleagues have defined it as the abiding faith of most American teenagers, and in a sense thus of a great number of the audience for the movie It, is characterized by the following. Number one, a God exists who created and ordered the world and watched over human life on Earth. Number two, God wants people to be good, nice, and fair to each other, as taught in the Bible and by most world religions. Number three, the central goal of life is to be happy and to feel good about oneself. Number four, God does not need to be particularly involved in one's life, except where God is needed to resolve a problem. And number five, good people go to heaven when they die. Now, in closing these remarks, I have no intention of attempting to repurpose these points into a direct corollary account of immoral therapeutic evil, although it's it with an E on the end. Instead, what I'd like to suggest, that was the funniest thing I've said this whole time, folks. <laughs> Instead, what I'd like to suggest is that the great appeal of a movie like It resides in its offering a representation of evil that is as easy and mushy as moral therapeutic deism's representation of the good, the horror of it aside. Evil exists, and it shows up in weird ways that grown-ups can't understand. Evil takes root in our lives because of psychological issues beyond our control. And only in coming to terms with these issues and through teamwork can we combat evil. The problem with such a representation of evil is that for both your average American teenager and for those formed and committed to a higher order understanding of the human person and of our place in the divine plan and to making sense of how evil exerts pressure on our efforts to participate in that plan, it's hard to take evil as a clown seriously. And that's exactly why the movie is so successful by making evil into a clown that occupies a natural spot in the moral therapeutic deism's cosmology and logic, it's entertaining to encounter a perfectly late American cultural paradox best enjoyed with other kinds of tasty deprivation, like a large Coke and jumbo popcorn. Thank you, and go Irish. And now for more on depicting evil and more than image, we have a joint presentation on chiaroscuro in the art of the, uh, from Caravaggio to Mel Gibson. So 
Uh, our first presenter is Elizabeth Lev. She teaches art history at Duquesne University and Christendom College in Rome. She's the author of three books, including a biography of Caterina Sforza, The Tigress of Forli. And she's currently working on a book on Caravaggio and the Art of the Reformation. Uh, I could say more about Elizabeth Lev because she happens to be my daughter, but if you want further information, you can speak to me later. Uh, her her co-presenter is my son-in-law, Thomas Williams. And Thomas is an author and a professor of philosophical ethics in Rome. He has 15 books, including my two favorites, uh, his study of the foundations of human rights that is called Who is My Neighbor? and his uh, study of Catholic social thought for a new generation that is called, the, uh, Thomas help me out on this, uh, The World as It Could Be. Uh, Thomas was consultant to Mel Gibson in the making of the movie A Passion of the Christ. And in 2003, when the movie came out, he traveled around Europe presenting it to audiences in many countries. So welcome, Elizabeth and Thomas. Thank you so much. And thank you very much to the Center for Ethics and Culture, of which we are very proud to be permanent research fellows and very honored to be. Uh, and thank you for the Soren Fellows and all those whose work have helped put together such a splendid conference. Um, I have to apologize right at the start. It's never good to disobey one's mother-in-law. And she said that we're supposed to speak about evil, but we're going to speak about good also. Uh, so we're hoping <laughs> you can give us, give us leave to speak about good because the chiaroscuro kind of demands both parts of this, of this light and darkness. And really, when, when art comes in contact with these great human but invisible realities, such as good and evil, which are moral, psychological, metaphysical realities, how do the visual arts, how can they uh, make them visible? How can they manifest them, reveal them? And we've gotten a very, very fascinating historical and, and actual contemporary look from Randy about how that can be done in the case of evil. But artists have been struggling this with this for since the beginning of art. And uh, one of the ways that they do this is by appealing to different natural symbols that can make this dichotomy apparent in a visible way. So that is, we're going to be looking at that today in a very particular way through the eyes of these two artists. So I didn't know that marriage meant I had to share a microphone, too. <laughs> we'll, see, we'll see how this works out. <laughs> no, so um, the problem is trying to make something that is invisible, uh, visible, So, but at the same time the importance of sight, the primacy of the sense of sight becomes a very important question. It pulls art into the mix of trying to depict and represent for people uh, good and evil. And Christian art actually started uh, in a very, very nice way. They started out by depicting the good. So we have the good shepherd, right? Isn't that one of our very first images? What are we presenting in the world? Filled with evil, as always, we put forward the good shepherd, who, by the way, you'll notice this one is the good goat herd. I always find that a very comforting image from the catacombs of Priscilla uh, the little goat that's kind of you know hoping to get caught up with the sheep too. So we already are looking for an idea of that's the best we can do for representing evil in the third century AD. But as we move into the Middle Ages, we begin to choose another vision of goodness. It's always trying to show goodness. Goodness is light. <coughs> goodness is this 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 quiet in the heavens. So that would be the Christians start out with this sort of emphasis on the representation of good. And then as we start to engage with the question of representing evil, it usually tends to be something that is pulled out of nature, kind of a strange mixing of figures, uh, kind of odd. Here you have, for example, one of my all-time favorites, the Virgin Mary saving a naughty child from a little demon that looks like swamp thing with a beard. And they're sort of putting together all the, put all the bad things you could possibly find, throwing them into one. That one, on the other hand, um, on the, the it's a section of Mazzolino's crucifixion, um, you'll see the little detail of the deformed mass 
being taken out of the mouth of the bad thief. That would be his soul. So you represent these representations of evil as something that's either formless, shapeless, this horrible little blob coming out. The good thief has an angel cuddling a sweet little baby. And uh, either that or some sort of conglomeration of a number of, of, of strange things. Now, this changed with the Renaissance where humanism began a whole new nuanced way of trying to show good and evil. And they tried to, they tried to use aesthetics. Um, uh, uh, they tried to figure out rules in art to be able to show something that's, that show good and evil in a way that's more acting and visible in nature. So these categories, there are, there are actually five or six categories that the Renaissance defines. We're going to be using three for time's sake. But remembering a little something that was brought to my attention during one of the uh, presentations this morning, I am referring to an era when art had rules. So uh, 15th, 16th, 17th century, art actually has to follow a certain amount of rules. Obviously, that's out the window in the modern age. But what is interesting that cinema does have to follow those rules. There are certain rules. The media actually does force you to follow certain rules. So these rules actually will apply to both of these artists. So we have these three different, we have three different uh, uh, ways, visually, of representing uh, good and evil. Carol's girl, we have to remember, has to do with contingency. Two things are contiguity. You need to have dark and light. You need to have good and evil. You need to have two that set each other off. It's not just about good or evil, but good next to evil. Good defined, set up against evil. And it's shown in many different ways, this idea of good and evil in art. We've chosen three that are particularly helpful, I think. Order and disorder. What was Aquinas' famous definition of beauty, splendor, orderness? The, the splendor of beauty, right? Sorry, the, the splendor of order is the splendor of, of a harmonic view of things that comes across to, as appealing, as visually attractive because of the order it represents. Whereas disorder, chaos, mayhem, these things that cause anxiety, this is the opposite, right? And that also is a way of depicting evil. Where there is chaos, where there is this anxiety, there is not peace, there is not beauty and goodness. The second, oh, sorry. Well, there's one just from, a, from, our, from the Renaissance art point of view. Um, in, in art, that means instead of using kind of a mad jumble of interlocking characters, you need to be able to apply a certain amount of order, uh, uh, composition, clarity, as you heard in the previous presentation, so that in the words of Giorgio Vasari, our 16th century art theorist, there is no confusion in the reading of the painting. The second category of that of form and deformity uh, remember, the Latin term for, for beauty, one of the terms, uh, is that of what is formosus. Formosus, we know that some of you study Spanish, hermoso comes from formosus. It is the word for beautiful. And deformis is a word for ugly. What is deformed is considered ugly. And the way of something being whole and complete, having integrity, is a sign of its goodness, whereas deformity is a corruption of that good. And it's important to remember here something that Randy brought up in the prior presentation, that evil has always been understood in the Christian tradition as being a privation, as being an absence. Evil is a parasite. It does not subsist on its own. There is nothing that is 100% total evil, even the devil himself. We talked about Lucifer being corrupted. Evil is always a corruption, a deformity of something that is good. And that's very important when it comes to depicting it. The, uh, that, that made a very important step for Renaissance art onward because now to, in order to depict things it requires a discernment on the part of the artist. The artist's job in the words of a 17th century theorist who is uh, Giovanni Battista Bellori is to draw from all of nature but not to take the deformities, to draw from all of nature to make the most perfect and the most good. So art finds a way of translating this into, into images. And the third category, that of light and darkness, which is the most typical <coughs> purist of, of chiaroscuro, is particularly compelling. Um, I remember when I was very small, probably third grade, uh, I had an art class. And they told us something that was very counterintuitive. They said that white, the color white, is all colors put together. And I said, when I take my crayons and I cover over, it does not turn white. And black is not a color at all. It's the absence of all color. It is nothing. And it's counterintuitive because when we start a work of art, if you start with your grant, you start on, what do you say, a blank sheet of paper. White seems to be the beginning, the absence of, and you add to it. But in reality, we know this also through physics, light is the composition. That's why a prism will break light up into its component parts, which are all colors. 
And this is true in the moral life and the metaphysical life as well, that the completion of all things, the integrity of all things, the good, is this idea of white or of light. And the absence of light, the hiding in the shadows, always has been, since even before Christianity, an idea that conveys darkness and badness. So the early Christian church confronted that question of light. It was one of the most effective visual, visuals that the Christians could use right away. For example, think of the difference between an early Christian church building with the clear stories flooded with light as opposed to the darkness of the internal cellas of the pagan temples or, or, or even yet the... Uh, 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 the Mithraic cult cells. Um, the whole idea of light has always been an important part of art, but the Renaissance, again, honed in on the concept of chiaroscuro, which, on a very technical level, chiaroscuro is simply the principle of making a three-dimensional image on a two-dimensional surface. And so in the work of Leonardo da Vinci, who is the one who writes a great deal about chiaroscuro, we see it at work, taking the lighter of the silver point pencil, creating the part where the light seems to reflect off the projecting planes, and then shadowing in order to create depth and volume. But Leonardo actually took his, he, he took his uh, discussion of chiaroscuro much more deep, much, it's much deeper than that. He talks about shadow that derives from two things that are different from one another, as one is corporeal and the other is spiritual. The shadowed form, he says, is corporeal and the light is spiritual. Shadow is the nature of all things of this world destined to fade whereas light appears to be without end. This brings us up to the actual incarnation of our topic today, these two artists that have a spectacular amount in common. Um, as, as my mother-in-law, Marianne Glendon, said, I will be speaking mostly to Mel Gibson, being that I uh, had some experience with him and in the making of the film The Passion of the Christ and what was going on in his head when he was doing that. But one of the things that very few people know is how much Caravaggio was in his head. Uh, when Mel Gibson was making the, the Passion of the Christ, he went and visited Caravaggio. He said that his goal is, as the next screen says, in making The Passion of the Christ, I wanted to create a moving Caravaggio. He loved the way that Caravaggio played with light, with dynamism, and he thought, if I can take this to the screen, what he already accomplishes in a single static plane, I can make this into religious art. By the way, The Passion of the Christ is very simply a piece of religious art. It is as if it were a, a, a painting that has been extended in, moving, in a moving medium, but it is simply a, a piece of religious art that is meant to convey and to inspire religious sentiment. All three, however, uh, both artists are going to challenge all three of those uh, paradigms of what religious, religious good, religious art, and the dep depiction of good and evil are supposed to be. So you'll find that these artists find themselves coming under heavy criticism from their peers. Uh, their works are considered in many ways jarring and anti-aesthetic and almost flying in the face of this tradition, and yet at the same time their works become profoundly effective. So we'll start with uh, Caravaggio, I think that would probably be... Uh, chronologically the best one, as we talk about order and disorder. Now Caravaggio, I think anybody who has read 20 seconds of Caravaggio's biography knows that he has problems with order in every single way, shape, or form, which in a certain sense is why he became so dear to me. Um, the uh, the uh, Caravaggio is an artist who, artistically speaking, leaving aside his personal life until the end, uh, Caravaggio, artistically speaking, is deeply challenged by the problem of composition because he has no experience in drawing. Leonardo, my Michelangelo, Raphael, the Florentine school, you cut your teeth learning how to draw and learning how to compose your figures in space in such a way that you create order. Caravaggio did not have that advantage, and so in a certain sense, Caravaggio's very active painting, a la prima, going up and you know, making mistakes and pentimenti. I see some of my former students here, so I'm assuming your vocab, your vocab is uh, coming back, but the fact of the matter is Caravaggio is his painting, his painting style, everything about it is not what is considered by his peers proper painting. In this particularly beautiful painting, the uh, Taking of the Christ from 1606, which is now in the National Gallery in Dublin after a long and very exciting story, um, it, is a, it is a painting where he's doing, uh, he's, uh, he's confronting the, the, the question with a certain amount of chaos. I mean, he starts out with a painting that looks very chaotic, and the interesting thing is, 
in the true Caravaggio fashion, he uses very few figures. Caravaggio does not like mob scenes because he's not good at them. In the usual way that you would show the, um, the arrest of Christ, for this is Giotto, you have a million different figures. But even with the huge group of figures, the clarity, the organization of the composition is absolutely obvious. You've got a group here, a group here, center piece. There's no sense of like chaos and tumble and fighting going on, unlike in the Caravaggio painting where you have the, can we back up for a second? Nope. Where you have the, whoops, we have the glints of metal, the movement rushing in, that, that figure of John running off in the distance. The figures are close, close, close to you. You feel a little bit like you're a little bit too close for comfort to the story. As everything you can barely figure out where you would be standing or how you would avoid being hit by one of those blows. So Caravaggio starts out by giving you a feel, an image of chaos, an image of a, a, a disorder in this image of the taking of Christ. This is something that's picked up by Mel Gibson. You'll see throughout this particular film, which we're going to focus on, the way that he brings in disorder to show chaos and to show evil. And he does it by associate also with the personification of evil, this figure of the devil that he brings in from the very, very first scene in this agony. You know that the word, uh, the Greek agonia is not the way we think of it today as very intense suffering or pain. Agonia meant combat, a combat or contest. It was, it was battle. And spiritual combat is what is taking place in the entire two hours and 20 minutes of this film. That is what is happening from the get-go. And it's done, you see that wherever the devil goes, the devil spreads, I was going to say he, but in this movie it's played by a female actress, spreads this chaos. So watch this scene of the taking of the Christ. You have literally a moving Caravaggio. You have the carol score of the torches of the men coming, and then you have the betrayal, which we're going to get into a little bit later. Um, he introduces the spiritual element from the very beginning. He is intending to depict not just evil as physically, but evil, evil as moral evil, and especially evil containing a very malevolent, powerful uh, presentation in the person of the devil. And here, just to kind of have as a, as a, as a code word, because Mel Gibson, as you know, meditated on this over and over again before the actual film was made. Be sober, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls about like, uh, like a lion, ready to see whom he can devour. And we're going to see him prowling about. There are five different appearances of the devil. The very first scene, the encounter with Jesus in the garden. The last scene is the destruction of the devil. The devil's being vanquished after the crucifixion when he realizes that he is lost. And three intermediate scenes where the devil goes about seeming to be winning, to having the upper hand. We'll see his appearance in the destruction of the character of Judas. We see his appearance again in the flagellation scene. We see his appearance again in the way of the cross. And watch the way that he sows this chaos as it goes along. <laughs> Those little children, as you recall in the movie, it's very difficult to, to know in this moment whether they're his imagination, whether they are in fact little demons, or whether they are in fact children. He plays with this ambiguity. But the fact is that he paints the devil among them as instigating them. And this chaos is what eventually uh, drives the person of Judas to kill himself. This is after he's betrayed Jesus. Um, look at this scene here. You can almost not see her or him, the, the figure of the devil behind this Roman soldier and the chief priest there during the flagellation scene. The presence of the devil who's walking behind, and you see that they get more and more heated in their passion and in their sadism in treating Christ. You see these characters who become almost inebriated and filled with glee over drawing blood and more and more blood from, from Jesus. This is the expression that you get, this, this actual joy in, the, in this sadism that they're enacting. 
On the other hand, this contrast between order and disorder we see by continually going back to the persons of Mary and the Magdalene. And Jesus himself, who heroically, not stoically, but heroically resists and stands up to this torture. But the person of Mary who insists on watching this scene, despite how difficult it is for us to watch it, it really is the model of this Christian heroism and order of goodness. We have the chaos then along the way of the cross, and again we'll find this depicted by the devil inciting it. This is a counterposition between Mary and the devil on either side of the way of the cross. And the third and final, well this, again, just to show that you know that as a good director, since you can only take so much of that absolute horror, there are flashbacks that give also a sense of this order in the life of Jesus, this, the goodness and the beauty. Look at that particular scene, which I find very compelling. Everything is harmonious and beautiful in this home with Mary and Jesus, the relationship they have, even the work that they're doing. Um, it's, it's a beautiful chance for the, the viewer to actually take a step back and remember goodness. So the trick is that in the midst of the confusion of those three scenes that Mel Gibson presents, he always gives a stabilizing force of calm. So versus, uh, instead of the disorder, or as a, con uh, a contraposto of the disorder, there is order. Even Caravaggio does that in this painting. Caravaggio actually does give us a fascinating anchor. Your first impression of looking at the painting of the taking of the Christ is you just see a lot of soldiers. You see Judas reaching up to kiss Jesus. You see John heading off in the other direction. You think there are people in the back, but you can't really make out anything. But the second time you look at it, you begin to realize that there's an arc in the painting that brings your eye into order. And the arc starts with Caravaggio's own portrait on the right-hand side. He rarely uses portraits, except when he's showing himself beheaded to say, I'm sorry, or uh, in, his, uh, in his first public work. But you see Caravaggio, who is doing something else which is very unusual, which is to hold up an artificial light. Anybody who knows about Caravaggio knows he doesn't use very, use very, very rarely. This is, I think, one of two paintings that actually uses artificial light. Uh, Caravaggio doesn't use an artificial light source, but there he is artist who is holding up the light, and that light helps us to find in the midst of the chaos the face of Christ, who is the one calm contained figure. And so it's really an interesting way that the artists, in the midst of their chaotic scenes, you see that the artist, Gibson director, Caravaggio painter, maintains a sense of control in how to bring the, the eye and the viewer back to a sense of calm and control. So, form and deformity. So, uh, when it comes to uh, form and deformity, uh, Bellori, John Giovanni Battista Bellori, who is the theorist of the 17th century, wrote about art during the time of Caravaggio, saying, beauty is none other than that which makes things as they are in their proper and perfect nature. And the best painters choose by contemplating the form of each one. So goodness is, is represented through perfection in form, and the ability of an artist to discern what is beautiful from what is not is actually the responsibility of an artist. It's what helps to make a good artist. As a matter of fact, Aristotle, Aristotle used the example of the practice of good painters, the practice of discerning the good from the bad in nature, to teach moral conduct. Now, art, again, had a very hard time with these ideals. It preferred to, at first to just kind of go for the crazy chimeric figures. So you add, like, some scales onto a wild boar, onto a couple other distressing creatures, and there you have a depiction of deformity. But for Caravaggio, it's a little bit more, it's a little bit more, more of a challenge. Because while this makes it very clear, you see the, the bestial nature of a person who has given himself over to evil, Caravaggio does not do things that are not in nature. Getting, to, getting him to paint an angel basically required putting a gun to his head. And so uh, Gar Caravaggio will actually tend to prefer to take the human face, which is, of course, perhaps at its best when it's more composed, and distort it through very, very violently expressed emotion. So in the case of, for example, the, the, the execution of Saint, or the, the murder of St. Matthew, he'll take the face of that, of that killer, which if you look at, if you look at most of the painting uh, in that era, when you have the murderer, or the person who's doing an evil action, he usually has a sort of indifferent face. They all look like they come from like central casting with sort of the perfect jawline and the hair, and they never like bat an eye when they're you know, killing people en, en masse. But Caravaggio's face is different. 
This man, this guy, this is a street fight. His face is red, his mouth is, his, his mouth is open. You can see the, the, the intensity of the face, that, that, that changing of the features as that pure visceral hatred is expressed in his face. In the case of, um, in the, case of the next painting, which is uh, the flagellation of Christ, take a look at the face of the man on the left which is contorted into this sickening grin of a man who's enjoying the torture that he's about to inflict on, on, on Christ. And so Caravaggio's way is to take nature, and instead of purifying it, he holds up a much more powerful mirror, what we look like when we're arguing, what we look like when we're rejoicing in other people's, in other people's pain or suffering. And so this really, it, it turns out that uh, it becomes very, it's very challenged by his contemporaries. Caravaggio produced a painting of Judith beheading Holofernes um, in the same era that uh, Guido Reni uh, produced his uh, produced his uh, Mike Saint Michael killing uh, Michael the Archangel killing Satan, and it's um, an interesting contrast because they're very similar. They're both forces of good and evil. They're both figures right up close. They both portray the moment of victory. So this is these are two paintings that make a kind of natural comparison. They come out of the same era, um, actually. They uh, but they are both reviewed by the same critic. And uh, Bellori, does, he criticizes Caravaggio's work because he, quote, copied the defects of the body and inured himself to the ugliness and faults. He used to say about Caravaggio, if you took away his model, his art went with it. But Guido Reni, on the other hand, praised because he had found this angel of earth, unearthly qualities. He said he couldn't find a face like that. He couldn't fly up to heaven to see what angels really look like. So he contented himself with the ideal of the most beautiful. But when it came to painting Satan, the idea of ugliness set forth to, he, when, he, when he had to come up with the idea of ugliness, he set it forth in the devil and he left it there. For I flee him, he says, even in thought, and try not to keep him even in my mind. And so the devil is painted with these very, very hasty brushstrokes, as if he can't wait to get it done and look away. Whereas when... Whereas the figure of, of, of uh, Michael the Archangel is much more, uh, much more carefully constructed. As a matter of fact, look at the ease with which the Archangel defeats Satan. Light blue, he wears blue, the cool color. This isn't an angel that's motivated by passion. This is an angel that shows how easy it is for the Archangels to defeat Satan. And now look at Judith. Judith, to begin with, part of the problem was uh, that uh, she was actually recognizable. She was a courtesan in the city of Rome, so people got a little upset about that. Um, but the fact is, look at that face. That's not an indifferent face. That's a furrowed brow for a woman who is doing something very distasteful, but she's doing it. And you look at that face, you look again at that other face, the distorted face of Holofernes, who really thought the evening was going to go a little differently. <laughs> and then what gets more deformed? What is a greater sense of deformation than a man whose head is partially removed? So he gives you this sort of gritty, horrible rendering, and he puts good and evil side by side. They are a traditional image of virtue and vice, Judith and Holofernes. She's not here, and he's here. They're here. They are locked in battle. She's winning. That's good. But it shows the battle as something that, what it really is, a battle. Mel Gibson does the exact same thing. You probably remember the very disconcerting uh, scene when Judas has first realized what he's done. He is filled with shame. He's filled with remorse. And these little children come up to tease him, the ones we saw earlier on with him, uh, with the devil in their midst. But he first shows them by showing a transformation in their faces. Watch what happens with this little boy. Mel Gibson plays with the face. In fact, his casting director told me, she said, all he really cares about are faces. All he really wants are really interesting and, in, in some cases, deformed faces. He wants to convey things through these close-ups, through faces. Here's the second boy. He actually needed a different actor to play that second one. The first one was just made up. This one actually was, was a different one to show this, this change that, that freaks Judas out so much when he encounters it. Look at the character that he chose for Barabbas, the one who we chose as humanity in place of Christ. Again, the evil is shown through this deformity, through something that is, that is repugnant to us as a corruption of the good. And finally, Look at this mockery of the Madonna and child.
Again, we have the deformity of the baby who is, at, at the one, on the one hand, trying to show that, this, that she is winning, that this is the victory over the real Madonna and child, but also it's the instigation. You saw walking behind the one who's directing the actual flagellation scene, who's the one who continues to up the ante on how much torture Jesus can take. So we also have, in, in the case of Mel Gibson, something that he was very criticized for. Like Caravaggio, who was, it was, the complaint was made that he was far too violent in his depiction of things. Mel Gibson's received the same. But also in his way of actually transforming Jesus. We have the Jesus Formosus, this beautiful face of Jesus. He, che he chooses a very, very handsome actor, Jim Caviezel, in, who becomes the Jesus Deformis, the one who is ugly. And we remember those words of Isaiah that he had no majesty, nothing beautiful about him to attract us in his passion. We had the criticism immediately go up after the release of the passion that unlike his very worthy predecessors, Franco Zeffirelli, who made uh, Jesus of Nazareth, we had the greatest story ever told. We had these different versions of ways to, uh, to uh, depict Jesus. We have this very bloody Mel Gibson who is just delighting in this in this violence. Another scene comparing the two. In the same moment of their passion, both on the cross, look at Zeffirelli's uh, versus Mel Gibson's. Mel Gibson knew Zeffirelli, right? He worked for them. He actually, this is very interesting, he, he, he did not particularly care for Zeffirelli. He worked because he played Hamlet in 1990 that Zeffirelli directed. And in fact, I remember speaking with him one time, asking him what he thought of Jesus of Nazareth. And he said, you know how tired I get looking at plastic crucifixes and these nice, beautiful, you know, soft ivory skin Jesus. He said, that's not the way it was, and I wanted people to see it the way it was. So the most effective way in art at the end of the day is, of course, light and shade. Um, the, uh, the Caravaggio, in his case, he harnessed light and dark for his storytelling, overcoming that great artistic stumbling block, the biggest question of the Renaissance world, to show the interior workings through exterior form. And Caravaggio found a way of doing that. As a matter of fact, despite Bellori's complaint that Caravaggio's use of the model, the model can't show you what's going on inside, he's just paid to sit there. Caravaggio found a way of using this very, very dramatic light that's more than just a question of illuminating, but it becomes really an actor. It helps to, it does, he uses a light without gray tones, gray half tones or gray areas, and it allowed the viewer to evince, evince, to see the good amidst the gritty. So you'll see that his art illuminates amid encroaching darkness. Darkness is always getting closer, and his light opens up. So when he first burst out of the starting gate, it was with the famous falling of St. Matthew uh, in San Luigi de Francesi. It's a work about conversion. It was meant for the Jubilee year of 1600. And he shows my, Matthew and his fellow tax collectors with a ton of money, fabulous clothes, everything is looking fabulous until Jesus erupts. And how we understand the story of the eruption of Jesus is through this light. He put in a window to give you a natural light source, and then he doesn't use it. He has the light come from behind Christ and to strike Matthew full in the face. And let me just be very clear here for people who have been reading the wrong articles. <laughs> That's Matthew. And so the... Um, so the fact is that he hits Matthew full in the face, and Matthew is pulled almost like a tractor beam. The light comes from physically, physically in the church, it comes from the area around the altar. And so he's using, really, in a contrast of Matthew seeing the light, as opposed to the other two figures towards the end, who are completely immersed in darkness. They continue to look downwards towards the darkness, whereas Matthew is the one who looks up towards the light. So light, darkness in Caravaggio's early work remains a desire or an ignorance or a willingness to remain in sin, as we see in the second painting, which in the story of the crucifixion of Peter, the four men on this hillside are all working. But three of them are unaware of the nature, or they, they're unaware of what they're really doing. You have three men crucifying Peter, who's who just come across his body parts. Mustard-colored gluteus maximus, a red shoulder, and a, and a green back. And you're moving like cogs in a machine. The fourth figure, illuminated from top to bottom, Peter, looking at the, at the nail in his hand. Again, the illumination of a man who sees and knows truth, whereas the people who struggle in darkness without really seeing what's going on around them. So Caravaggio starts out using light for the early years in a very different format. The light is for conversion or for seeing the path. So the light of the conversion of Saul, the light of 
Judith, who's being shown, you know, this, this, that this is virtue conquering vice, and then of course the light, as we said before, of Matthew, who's being called to follow Christ. So this very directed use of light at the middle, around 1606, he starts changing that actually a little bit earlier. He starts using light that's more nuanced and more complicated. It's a light that involves a lot more flickering and a lot more difficulty in understanding tones, half tones, where to look, exactly how to look without the same kind of direction. In this particular case, you see the death of the Virgin. He also does it in the Supper of Emmaus. The uh, second version, the one in 1606, not the one in London. And then, and then he produces the masterpiece. 1606, 1607, he's had to flee to Naples because he's killed a man. And he's in Naples, and he paints this image of the seven acts of mercy. He turns all the paradigms of good and evil we've talked about upside down because you're looking in an alleyway which you would never set foot in. If you started to walk down that alleyway and saw those people, you'd be like, yep, okay, going to some other way. It's a dark alley, and every single person in there looks on the surface of it to be of nefarious purpose. You've got the bravos, the thugs that you saw walking around the streets. You've got the kind of scrawny beggar guy. You've got the odd woman over there in the corner. You've just got a guy in jail. I mean, you're I'm not going down there, right? Not without my pepper spray. And then Caravaggio uses this light. And this light reveals bits and pieces. And what are these gritty people doing? The seven acts of mercy. So the bravos are actually sharing their cloak with the starving man. The other one has probably given his water to the man who's thirsty. The other man on the far end is welcoming the bravo, so he gives them a place to sleep. You see that, that figure with the light in the background bringing out a dead body to bury the dead. Simon and Pera, Simon, uh, Simon is in jail, Pero is there see, saving her father, visiting the imprisoned, feeding the hungry. This amazing, totally unexpected, not the kind of imagery you would expect to tell stories of good, but Caravaggio's light goes and begins to find good among the real, among the natural, among what looks like the gritty, grimy world around us. And herein lies the power of his chiaroscuro. In the case of uh, Mel Gibson, his use of the, of the light and the shadow, which fascinated him so much, he did it from a very theological beginning. He was really into the Gospel of St. John, and especially John's theology of light and darkness. So and so he would talk about it out loud. He would say that Jim could be, he would remind him of these passages, that Jesus is the light, that you have to be the light. Everything about you has to emanate this. That he's in the world, he's rejected, but the light, the darkness cannot overwhelm it. And also this fact, something that he knows from personal experience, that the real battle going on is not between human beings. And that's why his insistence on painting the supernatural uh, origins of evil around us and temptation because he really believes these words of St. Paul that our real struggle is not against the powers of this world, but against principalities and powers of the other. Look at the light and darkness in this first scene in the, in the Garden of Gethsemane. Take this chalice away from me, he gets a no from heaven. And the devil thinks to press his advantage. My back. And the light comes back. We have, too, this around the person of, of Judas, this idea of choosing the light or choosing darkness is the symbol of whether or not we receive God and his mission in his, and his Messiah. Um, we have the imagery of darkness in the, also in, in John's Gospel when the night of the Passion, when Judas leaves, darkness enters. And then we have the final scene of this absolute despair of Satan knowing that he has been tricked, that he has been beaten, which leads us to the greatest chiaroscuro uh, moment in the entire film.
years, we see all three categories come together. Order has replaced chaos. We see that form has replaced and overcome the deformity, and the light has overcome the darkness. And we end with this one thought, tying this into the lives of these two men, with a quote from St. Francis. Part of the reason we thought this was a particularly helpful uh, idea for this conference was the sense that... Pope Francis. Did I, what did I say? St. Francis? Not yet. Uh, Pope Francis. Um, these two men live what they depict in their lives. And this is something that the Pope is almost quoting Alexander Solzhenitsyn from the Gulag Archipelago when he says, today the Lord helps us understand that good and evil cannot be identified with neatly defined areas or specific human groups. These are the good, those are the bad. He tells us that the boundary line between good and evil passes through the heart of each person. It passes through the heart of each of us. That chiaroscuro that exists in every human life, the, the combat between light and darkness, order and disorder, form and deformity, is the story of each of our lives. And so these men, who personally have quite a bit of chiaroscuro in their own lives, become, in a certain sense, even more effective as a way of transmitting it. Arguably the only people who can transmit this kind of gritty image of light that comes into the encroaching darkness because they know it themselves. And we respond to it because we see it as a personal testimony as well as an artistic manifestation. Thank you. Elizabeth, and we do have time for a few questions. I would ask you to, um, to raise your hand, and when you pose your question, please state your name. And, and since we don't have microphones today, state your question in a clear, loud voice. They are struck dumb by your three presentations. Yes. That goes way back to the iconoclasm uh, old debate. Um, the, the question of whether or not it is an offense against God to depict natural beings and in somewhat engraven images, uh, it goes back. And that battle even reemerges during the Protestant Reformation with certain groups. But it's something that was soundly rejected by the Catholic Church in the sense that we have always believed that this depiction of images, which we saw at the very beginning from the catacombs on, I mean, Jesus himself is the image of the Father. Jesus himself is God made visible and present. You can look upon him. That's the inspiration of all Christian art, that God the artist actually gives us the image of himself in human form. I mean, that's how much more do we need than that? Yes. Uh, hi. Um, concerning it um, and uh, the presence of crown culture, um, I recall about, I think it was a year ago, um, this uprising in various, uh, shall we say, hooligans walking around in clown costumes and intentionally trying to spread fear and chaos um, and just general maliciousness. Do you see these two things as related or these just coincident? Well, I think maybe the only connection I would make is just that for some reason, uh, a clown is a <coughs> meaningful figure in our culture. Partly in the context of a clown being theoretically gentle, fun, etc. but there's always this sense that there's something kind of potentially malevolent about, about a clown. So it's kind of the classic kids are scared of clowns sort of thing. And I think King, if these kids were doing it, if, if nothing else, they were probably inspired in part uh, by the, the, the kind of the prevalence of Stephen King's it in our, in our broader culture going back many years. And then a larger sense of clowns is just these kind of weird figures. In terms of uh, the depiction of the deformed, I've noticed violence is more and more graphic to the point where it's 
TV when I was a kid, the gunshot, you guys first get hit, and there'd be a little bit of blood, and that's it. And now you see just stunning displays of graphic violence on primetime TV, uh, with their high scouts out there, and things like that. And is that something that has ebbed and flowed throughout the centuries in, in art and depictions of, of, of sin and violence? Or is that something entirely new as, as society seems to lose God more and more? And how do you situate the graphic nature of the fact that the Christ is not very good Christ? It is, it is the, and at least in, in the history of art, um, the uh, Caravaggio really challenged all the questions about graphic nature of depictions of violence, by the way. So the modern things that we see on television, for those of you who don't hear in the back, maybe. And um, just, as a, just as a little thought about art, there comes a moment when in the 60, late 16th century, there is a tremendous change from an art that would never show something too graphic. So like you say, you know, Judas holding the head of Holofernes kind of discreetly in a basket as opposed to severing it. But starting with the images of martyrdom, like the ones in Santo Stefano Rotondo, where we see incredibly graphic images of what other people do to Christians, it starts out with an understanding of the evil that there is in the world. Caravaggio and later on Artemisia Gentileschi are both artists who challenge that state of, I want to see something decorous, but at the same time, their use of graphic violence is really a reflection that's used to reflect the true nature of the battle with evil, which I've been hearing in a lot of presentations, and I keep getting those images in my head of how in the 16th century, when they really feel you have to understand you're doing battle with evil, they make images that show you it's really hard, sweaty, messy, messy work. In the, in the modern day, I would say a little bit more, that it, a lot of that is just through stimulus. So it's more along the question of shock art, the necessity of the gouging of the eyes and that almost salacious type of violence. And that's where you fall into the, the one of the most serious accusations against Mel Gibson was a kind of salacious type of violence. They actually even spoke of it as, although this was people who really hated him and hated the Christian work he was doing, but they talked about it as a form of pornographic violence, that he took pleasure in producing this. But that was really, at least in my mind, simply an attempt to, to smear the film rather than, I mean, I found it, it's a very troubling film to watch. You, you, nobody would go, that's why at the beginning I went, it's religious art, it's not really a film in the sense that you don't go and buy popcorn and enjoy it, you like the film. Nobody likes the film, <laughs> but you're not, you're, you're meant to be moved by the film and changed by the film and your understanding and your appreciation of Christ's suffering is, is meant to grow through the film, which is a very different thing, and that was his intent. Can I ask one question? On my part, I mean, people watch Game of Thrones. They subscribe to HBO to watch that graphic violence, delight in it, talk about it, get all like, oh, I can't wait to see what they do tomorrow. And yet, when it comes to watching the flagellation of Christ, everyone's like, oh, I don't want to watch that. I don't want to watch it. Everybody suffers through it. And so it's an interesting way that he depicts that violence in a way that it's not. Like, tune in next week, and maybe they'll cut some other party part off. But instead, you know, a sense of, of, of I don't want to have to watch this. We have time for one more question. This gentleman over here. Uh, thank you very much. Um, throughout both presentations, I kept thinking of the Milton line, darkness visible. And I just want to ask both of you, or all three of you, um, what's the formal difference in the resources <coughs> that the written word has versus visual art? Because it seems that writers have a great disadvantage here. They cannot use light and darkness directly. So how, how do those of us who love writing compensate? I think writers have a built-in natural amazing advantage, yeah. to be honest. And it's because we've got the imagination yeah. to play with, yeah. right? And so it is the strength, actually, I think, of the written word that allows us to spend, find me a, show me a million different depictions of Dante's Inferno, and I will take the poem over every single one of them every single time. I think, frankly, I almost feel bad for the visual artists and the painters because they don't have the... <laughs> Well, you don't. I, mean, I get all of this. They just get screamed. So I think I think I'm okay with the with that. I was about to say, how many people say wait for the movie? <laughs> well, Liz, Liz said something alluded to something in the very beginning where Aquinas talks about the five senses, and he says that the, the sense of sight is that which is closest to the intellect because it's the closest to understanding. Which is why when you get something, you say, "Oh, I see. I see." What do you mean you see? I see. I now see it. I didn't see it before. 
there really is a binding between the two, and they complement one another. And just to be a peacemaker here, so it's not about either or, but each one affects you in a different way. It affects you, either. but anyway, that's I think. Can I add one more thing on that? I, I, it's true. It's true. It's a knee-jerk reaction to defend Caravaggio, but every single treatise on painting is always about how the closer painting comes to poetry, the better it is. The picture is the painted word, and on a personal note. I read it when I was telling my mom. I read it when I was in the 1980s. I told her not to. And <laughs> I took it. I read it in the hallway, school hallway during break, and it was terrifying. I was like 17, 18, whatever it was. I was terrified, and the movie has never quite yeah, been important. able to evoke what those words managed to evoke. So in fact, the, the writer, no matter how many times they remake it, the 1,000 pages takes you in a place that you really find very hard to get out of. Well, wonderful questions and wonderful presentations. Please join me in talking about